We're now going to spend the rest of this first section looking at the right hand side of the diagram. We're going to explore the idea of morality. You'll notice that when we're talking about moral issues, meaning the difference between right and wrong or good and evil, we need a dividing line to separate the two. This line that defines the difference between good and evil is known as the moral law. C.S. Lewis gives us insight into this law in the opening page of his book, Mere Christianity. He says, Everyone has heard people quarrelling. Sometimes it sounds funny and sometimes it sounds merely unpleasant. But however it sounds, I believe we can learn something very important from listening to the kinds of things they say. They say things like, How'd you like it if anyone did the same to you? That's my seat. I was here first. Leave him alone. He isn't doing you any harm. Why should you shove in first? Give me a bit of your orange. I gave you a bit of mine. Come on, you promised. People say things like that every day, educated people as well as uneducated, and children as well as grown-ups. Now what interests me about all these remarks is that the man who makes them is not merely saying that the other man's behaviour does not happen to please him, he is appealing to some kind of standard of behaviour which he expects the other man to know about. And the other man very seldom replies, to hell with your standard. Nearly always he tries to make out that what he was doing does not really go against the standard, or that if he does there is some special excuse. He pretends there is some special reason in this particular case why the person who took the seat first should not keep it, or that things were quite different when he was given that bit of orange, or that something has turned up which lets him off keeping his promise. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behaviour or morality or whatever you like to call it, about which they really agreed. And they have. Quarrelling means trying to show that the other man is in the wrong, and there would be no sense in trying to do that unless you had some sort of agreement as to what right and wrong are, just as there would be no sense in saying that a footballer had committed a foul unless there was some agreement about the rules of football. So people inherently know about the standard or rule of fair play known as the moral law, and when two people argue, they will instinctively try to show that they are on the right side of the dividing line and the other person is on the wrong side. It's sometimes called trying to claim the moral high ground, and indeed, that's the basis on which arguments are won and lost. All people instinctively know about the standard, children and adults, educated and uneducated, and all people instinctively want to be on the right side and not the wrong side. The question is, why? Why do we all know about this moral standard? Why is it so instinctive? Where did it come from? Why are we so concerned about wanting to be on the right side of it? We can get some understanding on this issue by taking a look at apples. Go with me here and take a look at this apple. Now, would you eat this apple? Do you think it would taste good? If you're sensible, you wouldn't put this near your mouth because you know just by looking at it that this is a bad apple. But how do you know that it's bad? The only reason that you know that this is a bad apple is because you know what a good one looks like. If we didn't know about this standard, in other words, if we never seen a good apple before, we wouldn't know whether the previous one was a good one or a bad one. For all we would know, that could just be what an apple is supposed to look like. It's only because we have the good as a reference point that we can recognise the bad. Whenever we say anything is good or bad, we are actually comparing it to an absolute standard. When we say something is good, we're saying it meets the standard, and when we say it's bad, we're saying it falls short of the standard. Let's illustrate it a second way. The only reason we know this is darkness is because we've seen light and we recognise darkness by the comparison. If an alien who had no concept of light were to land on planet Earth at midnight, for all he would know, this is as light as it would ever get. At 4am, however, when the sun was rising, his understanding would change. When he sees this, he would then understand that what he previously thought was light was actually darkness, and he only understands that by the comparison. But even what he now thinks is light would pale by comparison again with what he experiences at midday when the sun is highest in the sky. Only now, having seen absolute light, would he have a full understanding of the darkness. Only now would he have a full appreciation of the difference. What he initially thought was light wasn't light at all. Even what he saw at 4am has turned out to be darkness by comparison. 
So a growing understanding of the light gives a growing understanding of darkness. And only a perfect understanding of light gives a perfect understanding of darkness. The absolute light becomes a reference point or a benchmark for us. It's the same with morality. If we're to truly understand good and evil, we need a benchmark of absolute good as a reference point by which to recognise and measure evil. If we have no knowledge of that benchmark, we can have no real understanding of good or evil at all. Now that absolute and perfect benchmark of goodness is God. God is the only objective and absolute reference point of goodness that we know of. If we get rid of God as our benchmark, we are morally lost. C.S. Lewis wrote, When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. This is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you are awake, not while you are sleeping. You can understand the nature of drunkenness when you are sober, not while you are drunk. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. You have to know God as a reference point of absolute good to truly understand evil, and the better you know that absolute good, the better you will understand the difference. If that fixed standard of goodness is taken away, then you have no way of knowing what right and wrong or good or evil actually is at all. So our understanding of the moral law completely depends on our understanding of God. The moral law stems from God. It is an expression of who he is. The standard of the moral law is God's standard. The moral law is God's law. American legal philosopher James Wilson put it well when he said, It should always be remembered that this law, natural or revealed, made for men or for nations, flows from the same divine source. It is the law of God. Let's put it one final way. You often hear people talking about moral compasses, this inner sense of right and wrong that regulates our behaviour. I remember during the London riots in 2011, the news channels were filled with people shaking their heads, wondering what had happened to everyone's moral compasses. Well, real compasses only work in reference to a fixed point called magnetic north or true north, and the compass gives your bearings in relation to it. If magnetic north did not exist as an absolute reference point, then the compass would be completely useless. It's the same with moral compasses. They only work in reference to an objective fixed point of morality called God. Without that absolute fixed reference point of goodness, we have no way of navigating right and wrong or even knowing what those words mean. Take God away and our diagram looks like this. There is no moral law anymore, no fixed reference point to divide between good and evil, no benchmark of goodness, no boundaries, no such thing as absolute right and wrong. Instead, each individual is left to create their own moral code, define their own individual standards of right and wrong, go in whatever direction they think is best, live by their own rules. In other words, they can just do whatever they want. Morality is no longer objective but subjective. It is no longer absolute but relative. People without God have nothing to refer to except themselves, so every person becomes their own standard of goodness, their own moral arbiter. So in a sense, each person becomes their own God. And you know what? People quite like this thought. It sounds liberating to remove the restraint of the rigid moral code that God's existence imposes. And let's be clear, the moral law is indeed rigid. C.S. Lewis again wrote, There is nothing indulgent about the moral law. It is as hard as nails. It tells you to do the straight thing and it does not seem to care how painful or dangerous or difficult it is to do. People hate that. When we've wronged someone and we know we should apologise, it's the hardest thing in the world to obey our conscience. In those moments, we would love to find a loophole in the moral law that would let us off the hook. But the moral law is as hard as nails and it demands that you do the right thing and apologise anyway. When we have a chance to download free music instead of paying for it, when we see some tempting chocolate in the refrigerator that doesn't belong to us, when lying would allow us to escape punishment or gain some other personal advantage, there's a part of all of us that wishes the moral law didn't exist. We'll often wrestle with it in a vain attempt to find our loopholes. We'll try to create grey areas and blur lines or erase them altogether. 
They didn't apologise when they wronged me, so now we're even. Musicians are rich, they won't miss a few pennies from me. They're on a diet anyway, I'm doing them a favour eating their chocolate. If I lie just this once, I'll make up for it in other ways later, and it's only a white lie anyway. And does the moral law really say... We try to manipulate, bend or erase the moral law to accommodate our whims and selfish fancies and to appease our conscience. What we'd really like is to be liberated from it altogether so that we can do what we want. Do what you want. We can't deny how freeing that sounds. But unbeknownst to many people, the golden rule of Satanism is simply this. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Or in plainer English, do what you want. Or to put it a third way, Satan's law is that there is no law at all. It's a law of lawlessness, chaos, anarchy. Just do what you want whenever you want to do it. As far as laws go, it's a very simple one. If you don't want to apologise, then don't. If you want that chocolate, then take it. If you want that music, download it. If you need to lie about it, then lie about it. Do anything that makes you happy. Put yourself first. You are your own god. Satan claims the selfish, licentious egocentricity represents freedom. Remember what he whispered in the ear of Adam and Eve in Eden. He told them that God, with his strict rules about right and wrong, was a tyrant and an oppressor, and if they broke free from him and went their own way, they could establish their own moral code. They could live how they wanted. They could become their own gods. And he did it by trying to suggest loopholes, blur lines, and create grey areas in God's strict instruction. Did God really say you couldn't eat that fruit? So notice that when you reject God's moral law, you automatically accept Satan's. Either you accept and submit to an objective moral code, or you reject it to live by your own rules. In which case, right and wrong as concepts simply become what you want them to be. Satanism is far more mundane than blood sacrifices and dancing naked round cauldrons. It's simply rejecting God's binding moral law and doing what you want instead. Satanism is effectively just self-worship or self-deification, living by your own moral creed, going your own way. Indeed, the highest holy day for a Satanist is their own birthday, as it represents the birth of their own God, themselves. A lot of Satanists don't even believe in a literal figure called Satan, but simply claim him as a symbol of their liberation. When we understand all this, we are faced with the shocking realisation that because the majority of our secular society has decided to reject God and follow their own path, the majority of society are actually following Satan without knowing it. And as we've already learned, those who follow Satan will meet the end that he meets. What is more, as people reject God, they reject the benchmark or reference point of absolute good, so they begin to lose sight of what good and evil means, and as they instead do what they want, they don't realise how bad they are becoming. They stop being able to understand their own sinfulness. Their moral compass goes into a spin. The Bible says, Most men will proclaim every one his own goodness. Even Hitler genuinely thought highly of himself. People without God become like mouldy apples who can't see their own mouldiness because they've got no true concept of a good one. Or like a 4am sky that thinks that that's as light as a sky can be. They don't realise just how far short of the benchmark they are. A godless person doesn't just become evil, but they understand the difference between good and evil less. Their minds become dark and confused. This is the problem then that so many people are following Satan to his destination in hell, totally unaware of their sin, totally convinced of their own goodness, and totally convinced of their own worthiness of heaven.